one of the most heartbreaking outcomes for an editor is to have to let go a manuscript with a truly inspired research question, something that's really important. But because of inadequate methods or conduct to support it, it cannot proceed. And I'm sure it's similarly distressing to the authors, to the investigators, and to the funders for that type of study. Especially when it's in a situation where the shortcoming might easily have been avoided. In series paper two, presented by Mike Bracken, who holds multiple professorships at Yale, there are some suggestions of how to improve value and reduce waste through smarter research design, conduct, and analysis. So I'm presenting this paper of which I am not an author, um, but uh, I am here. Uh, and this is actually paper two of the, uh, the, the series. Here are the, author here are the authors. And this is, these are the four main issues that uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, I've, got some, I'm, I've stayed true to their main points, but I've, I've got some of my own examples in here. So effect size to bias ratio, um, I'll talk about that quite a bit, and then issues in development of protocols, you've heard some of that already from uh, Dr. Chan, uh, issues in research workforce and various stakeholders, and then reproducibility. The effect size bias, um, I can perhaps more quickly just mention that in terms of one of the most famous bits of research done in England, the um, smoking lung cancer studies. If, if you remember, those, that talk, th those actually discovered risks of uh, 15 to 30 uh, or 1,500 percent to 3,000 percent increased risks. And in that sort of study, uh, you can tolerate a lot of bias. It doesn't destroy the, 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 the chance of finding an observation. Most studies nowadays, we're talking about just a 100% increase in risk. That's a relative risk of two, or 50% increase, or 10% increase in, in genomics. And in those kinds of studies, uh, but it's very easy to get lost, uh, the findings lost with bias. So I, that's what I want to uh, spend some time, some time talking about. So these effects we, we focus on now are very small, uh, but the biases are numerous. Small effects difficult to distinguish from bias, and there are many of them. So this is a, a slide from the um, from Ioannidis's group, and any epidemiologist can hang any number of interesting studies on these. But I just wanted to focus on two. First one being recall bias. So you can you see down there, and the example of how this destroys data is, is from this infamous uh, meta-analysis that was. Uh, prominence on the NCI website at the time of Ronald Reagan's presidency, but it was looking at the question of whether a prior induced abortion increased risk for breast cancer, and uh, so of course there was, from this, an increased and highly significant relative risk, 30% increased risk. So that increased risk is typical of things that we're now concerned about. Um, Fortunately, uh, this, this was wrong, this, uh, this meta-analysis, and it was wrong because of recall bias. These are all case control studies, and when you think about how we do those, we are asking women who've had breast cancer about their history, reproductive history, including prior induced abortions, and we're asking uh, usually a healthy control group of women. And there's systematic bias here in that the um, healthy women would tend to under-report their history of induced abortion, particularly in these studies done in the United States. Uh, given, given the result that you seem to get more induced abortions in the cases, the breast cancer cases. We, this sort of suspicion that this was wrong was confirmed by a very large Danish study, one and a half million women looked at, no interviewing at all here, just medical records linked from the prior induced abortion and the breast cancer diagnosis and the relative risk here is very reliably one, so no increased risk. So recall bias not only affects individual studies, but it can, it can affect uh, entire bodies of, uh, of literature. Just to pick one other example from here, interviewer bias. Uh, this is another 
a set of studies that looked at the question of whether high residential electromagnetic fields was associated with childhood leukemia. And the uh, first study to be published was Wertheimer and Lipa there, suggesting about a threefold increased risk. Uh, this analysis by Higgins et al. nicely separates out the high quality studies on the top, which are showing really no effect, and the poor quality studies suggestive of an effect. What was going on in this study was the interviewers who were talking to the uh, who were looking at uh, residential electromagnetic fields were actually going to these homes of the, of the cases and the controls. Uh, they knew it was a home of the case or control, and what their job was to try and look at the thickness of power lines um, going to the houses, and then they were assessing electromagnetic field exposure from, from that. Uh, but knowing that they were at the home of a case or a control uh, seems to have, uh, have influenced their... Um, conclusions about about, uh, exposure. This is uh, one of, um, again from Ioannidis' group, this is is looking at randomised trials. They uh, analysed just over 85,000 of them and uh, only 9.7% had odds ratios more than 5. But interestingly, as and these were in the first published studies and generally found in small trials, not surprising, but as the, these series of trials went on, 98% of these large effects actually became smaller. And this is now almost an observation of nature that the very early studies in any series tend to be finding bigger effects than smaller ones. This is an example again uh, from Ioannidis uh, looking at genetic work. On the left are the first studies and what they're showing is either a very strong protective effect of a polymorphism and the whole range of different diseases being looked at or a, or a, much, or a strong risk effect. But then as in each of these series it goes forward and as the studies go forward they're actually looking at larger sample sizes, they all come to, uh, to one. So again an example of uh, this phenomenon of early, early research and often the first research showing very strong effects. We call this a winner's curse. You know, if, you, if you've been on a, on, a, on a painting at an auction, you, uh, you win. Uh, you, you are the only person in the world that thinks that painting is worth that amount of money. Well, um, here, uh, if you get your claim in for a first, a first observation of an association, it's highly likely to be uh, inflated uh, or are, in fact, wrong. So these are... Um, all to do with the effect size to bias ratio. Uh, in trials, allocation, concealment, and blinding, and how we randomize can influence effects. Weakly randomized uh, or poorly allocated trials, these are the ones where we get the bigger effects, and the similar thing in case control studies. Uh, so the design features of many studies are suboptimal in both human and animal studies. Let's just look at some animal work. This is a very nice review by Malcolm McLeod, who we've heard from, and, and David Howells and others. David is, is here. You've already heard these are very rare, these uh, systematic reviews in the animal world. But this is uh, their analysis on a 10-point scale of about 30 animal studies, all looking at that, that uh, particular drug, and um, only one actually blinded the therapy in these animal, a series of animal studies. Only two blinded the assessors who were looking at these animals and deciding whether they'd recovered or not. Uh, there are actually three, uh, three studies scored zero. They couldn't get any of these methodology scores um, right, and the top one only scored seven. And unfortunately, uh, this, this was a very nice analysis by McLeod and his group. Uh, it's been shown in other ones, very similar, uh, similar work. The, the animal work is very poorly conducted. And when you set up these criteria, um, it shows the opportunity for bias is, is huge. This is... Um, from uh, the paper, and it's showing that even now, with some improvement, uh, but in the blue there, randomization of animals to treatment of or placebo or control 
uh, still only being achieved in less than a third of studies and um, blinding the assess- assessors uh, is even lower, it's about 5%. So it, it, even in uh, now, the quality of research in the animal area is extremely poor. In the paper, there are some recommendations uh, for how to improve it. Uh, the, um, in terms of protocols, of course, registering protocols, just as we heard this morning, uh, improving sample size, cal- uh, sample sizes. Uh, these animal studies are, are notoriously small, and uh, randomly assigning groups and, and so on. This has actually all been put together in in the arrive statements. Uh, these guidelines that came out just a, uh, a year or so ago, and um, these are guidelines for how you publish research. But they clearly. Would, would lead re- investigators into, into uh, designing and conducting studies in, an, in a, superior, a superior way. There's another set called the Gold Guidelines that have come out from Holland, which, and they do focus more on, on conduct of research. So here, here's, here's an opportunity for folks in this area of research to really, really improve what they're doing. Um, so some other options for improvement to design research which involves larger effects um, this is a double-edged sword because if you do design studies, let's say in high-risk populations where you might expect larger effects, and of course the results are not, not as generalizable, but uh, it's, uh, it is something that needs to be needs to be considered. And thinking a lot in a lot more detail about the uh, magnitude of effects, not just doing simple power uh, calculations, and. Um, and deciding what actually is clinically important, what are, what are important effect sizes to, to look at. Um, the grade guidelines are now out, and they, they provide an opportunity to, to rank uh, the um, for investigators to rank their results in terms of how well they, they think they've handled biases. These are now being used in the Cochrane collaboration fairly extensively. Um, so. Developing protocols and improving designs. Presently, there is in observational <coughs> epidemiology and in anim- the animal work poor or no protocol development and documentation. <coughs> there is poor utility of existing information uh, in designing studies, not looking back at what's already in existence. I'm sure you've heard about this several times now, what the extant literature is, what is this new study actually going to, to accomplish, and being more, much more realistic about statistical, uh, statistical power. The bottom one, talking about vibration of effects, uh, those of you who have spent any time analysing uh, research data know that it's very easy in deciding which models to use, which variables to include as confounders. You can actually get substantial changes in your effect size, uh, not only just influencing the p-value, but changing the, the associations in a, in a major way. And these are, right at the moment, in, in almost every piece of research, they're hidden. Uh, nobody reports the different ways they've modeled data or analyzed data before they actually got to the analysis that's in the published report. And, um, and those would be areas where I think uh, much more documentation would be important. This is a, a, from uh, Tom Chalmers, uh, no relative, but a good friend of Ian's, who published in uh, 1992 this nice, and I think it's one of the first cumulative meta-analyses um, of streptokinase for myocardial infarction. And what it's showing is that at some point you, you move, uh, I'm using it now to show, you move from necessary replication to uh, wasteful duplication. Now, you could argue at what point on this continuum that, that happens, but I would suggest that it, down here in 1998, when the ISIS trial was launched, which was going to expose another 17,000 people uh, in, a, in a randomized trial, half of them getting placebo, well, that was the estimate of risk, uh, or benefit, I should say, before the ISIS trial, that's the, what, what the ISIS trial added. Um, if this had been done prospectively, it, of course it wasn't, most of these are not, 
But if it had been done prospectively, like, like now we're encouraging people to do, then I suspect the ISIS trial would never have, never have been done. But maybe even up here, uh, there was a, we'd reached a point where additional research was actually duplication. Uh, one trick in trying to improve power in studies, which is uh, not, a, not a good idea, but it's widely done, is to create uh, composite endpoints. This is one from the UK um, Prospective Diabetes Study. And all of that in red, in the red square, is one composite endpoint. Um, and it certainly would increase their statistical power, but unfortunately it makes it, makes it uninterpretable. And uh, it's even biased because the bit there in, in italics, retinal photocoagulation, that was actually added after the trial had finished. And that was one of the most dominant components of this, of this uh, composite endpoint. So there are many uh, sort of tricks of the trade in trying to achieve uh, statistically significant results. Uh, most of them at present are hidden in, uh, in, well, not even in protocols, they're hidden in the way the trial is analysed. Uh, and, and conducted, and um, this is where we, we want more exposure. This is, um, this is from The Lancet. This is Ian Roberts' uh, crash uh, meta-analysis, and I'm showing this because we've got here from 1972 to 1995 uh, quite a number of very small trials looking at this question of whether steroids were protective in, the, in, in head injury. And if you look at them, none of these trials had any chance of actually answering the question. Uh, these are all uh, neurosurgeons. I actually know quite a few of them. I, I'm fairly confident in saying none of them had any uh, training in, in doing me me medical research. And the, um, the, the, metro, the, the, the typical effect is here from that. And it's only when we get the, the crash trial with its 10,000, because that was an interim analysis, it was planned to do 20,000, uh, did we actually get data that very clearly showed steroids not being uh, effective in, um, in treating head injury. So this is really wasted research. This is useful research. So uh, public options for improvement, public availability of registration of protocols, we've, we've, we've heard about that, and um, looking carefully at research designs in terms of their power, their precision, and so on, to uh, make sure that the research that's being done is actually going to provide a useful result. Whether or not it's positive or negative, it would, would be a useful result. And to not try and trick the statistical power um, issues. You know, most studies are designed to test alphas of 0.05, sometimes 0.01, and that's so marginal uh, in terms of errors that can come into research, um, confounding issues. Uh, my own view is we should be we should be designing trials and observational work that is at least uh, 0.01 and perhaps even uh, smaller. That's not in the paper, that's, that's my editorial comment. The research workforce, um, we do know that statisticians and methodologists um, are not always involved in, in, in research. Clinical researchers often have poor training. There are programs to try and deal with that, but this is, that this is a state right now. Laboratory scientists is probably even worse. Um, they're actually quite rare for people who do animal work to be formally trained in research uh, methodology. And there aren't many programs to do that. And then, of course, we've got conflict, uh, conflicted uh, stakeholders on the issue of conflicts of, uh, of interest. This um, is looking at, it's a very, this is only about three weeks old, but it is, uh, there are many examples of this. This is a systematic review of systematic reviews. 18 looked at the question of drinking sugar, sweetened soda, does it increase the risk of obesity? Uh, 12 of these systematic reviews, the reviewers reported no conflict of interest. 83.3% found an association of obesity and weight gain. And six reviews were funded by Coca-Cola and people like that. And very interestingly, exactly the same percentage found insufficient evidence to form a conclusion. Um, so 
I, I could show you a whole string of these. I'm sure many in the audience could as well. Uh, clear uh, evidence of different conclusions being derived uh, depending on, on funding source. <coughs> So more methodology should be involved in all stages of research and enhanced training of clinicians and scientists. The second one is particularly interesting to those who work, who work in academia. Um, there's been quite a, a growth in uh, Master of Science degree programs for clinicians who are doing research, much less so for folks who work in animal research and in vitro re research in general. They tend to learn from their um, academic uh, or their advisors or their um, lab supervisors who were never taught either. So um, there's a lot of room there for improvement. In terms of reproducibility, uh, this is the question of the f uh, this enormous focus we, we put on, on, on being the first to... Uh, make these observations, which I've showed you earlier, tend to be uh, almost certainly are inflated. Uh, we, we don't honour the replicators who are actually the ones showing that a body of research is worthwhile. Um, this happens in academia, where we, um, we don't support replication very much, and it certainly happen, it occurs in the funding area. We've, we know there's a lot of evidence. Uh, I, Dr. Chan mentioned this, that empirically it's hard to show re repeatability in, uh, in research and uh, questions about finding the data. It's very difficult. <coughs> the reward mechanisms are clearly for the first people out of the block um, and uh, they, they're the ones that make the news. And unfortunately that is still driving a lot of the... Um, the research that is, uh, is being produced. I think any epidemiologist that works in the clinical medical centre will tell you, as my experience has been, uh, working with uh, people who are desperate to be the first ones to publish in an, in an area, and shortcuts tend to be uh, tried to be taken at least. I'm not sure where this, where this, what the source of this is, but it, it came from John Ioannidis again, but what it, what it is showing that over half of published data cannot be reproduced and that's because the data are not available or the software is not available or the methods are unclear, things like that. Um, and even among the bits that can be reproduced, only a tiny piece up here can be re reproduced in principle. Here we've got other discrepancies involved in, um, in trying to get re uh, replication. So, uh, in, in academia, uh, it's true, promotion committees do emphasize quantity over quality. Uh, it's, I, I, this is my editorial thing. I think it is published prolifically, or perish, unfortunately. Um, and it's also true that you can actually publish almost anything. There are, I think, over 5,000 medical journals now. <coughs> you just have to keep uh, resubmitting and resubmitting if you're that way inclined. And in the third one is actually to do with grant applications, which are often exaggerated, where investigators are promising to uh, perhaps find associations which, and powering up to find associations that are actually in, implausible. So uh, work to be done all around here, support and reward at both funding level and publication level, papers that actually uh, have being more transparent in the way they've been produced, they are allowing their data to be shared and, and have been shown to be reproducible. The bottom point, post-publication, I would throw some comments about that in the discussion right at the end of the morning session, uh, I've called that going beyond the citation index and it's really trying to uh, look at uh, papers in a much more detailed way to try and judge their value. There was a, a comment in the, in the, in the paper that's uh, in, in the Lancet now that it's much harder to rig, let's say, some criteria being cited more than 300 times. Um, you can cite the number, of, you, can, you can manipulate the citation index to uh, quite a large degree if you know how to do it. 
<coughs> that there are ways perhaps that it could be developed that, that can't be manipulated. So the three final recommendations, uh, make publicly available all the protocols, analyze plans or sequ uh, sequence of analytical choices, that's the vibration effect in the analysis, uh, put raw data out for people to have, and um, this could all be monitored in, in, uh, in ways that you can see there, me measuring how many protocols are, are, are out. There's been a big debate in epidemiology about, about uh, whether observational protocols should be registered. I, I strongly believe they should, but there is some, uh, some opposition to it. Uh, people think it's, it's somehow inappropriate or um, can't, be, can't be done, but we are uh, plugging away trying to, trying to change that. Uh, second major recommendation is to maximise this effective bias ratio uh, by trying to reduce as much as possible and anticipate the problem of bias and to uh, maximise the effect size that's going to be detected, but within, um, within the constraints of not being uh, unreasonable about that. And then thirdly... Uh, is rewards with funding and academic or other recognition. The, the people who tend to reproduce work, not just the people who are the first ones to, uh, to demonstrate associations. And to really try and change the culture <coughs> which is supportive of replication studies. Uh, if any of you have been involved in applying for money to the National Institutes of Health and you've got to put your granting through a study section, uh, it is almost impossible to get funded to do replication research. Uh, it, it, I, I've served on these committees, I've been involved in them for over 40 years, and it is extremely difficult to get funding saying, I want to replicate uh, so, someone else's work. So uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of um, work needs to be done there to try and improve the culture of, of the importance of replication. Monitoring, of course, looking at proportion of studies that are undergoing rigorous independent replication. The, um, this whole series, actually, is not <coughs> trying to rearrange these deck chairs, which, of course, are on the Titanic. Uh, my own view is that this, these, these are five actually really important papers which, if the message can can get out, and if it can bring about a, a culture change in all the areas that these all of these papers talk about, it will substantially uh, change the um, the culture of medical research in, in an extremely important and positive way. Thank you.